Hello, my name is Reed, and I'll be talking about Samathi, a DSO of flows for safe blockchain assets. So there are many uses for smart contracts on blockchains. Smart contracts are just programs that run on the blockchain, um, such as cryptocurrencies, voting, crowdfunding, auctions, and many others. Smart contracts manage, and importantly lose, a lot of money. The Dow contract lost over $40 million in 2016 due to a simple reentrancy bug, and there are many other examples of smart contracts losing money. Um, and importantly, smart contracts on Ethereum cannot be patched after being deployed, um, meaning that if there's a bug like this, you may be able to just drain all of the money out of the contract uh, without anybody being able to do anything. So this is one of the reasons that we're designing this new programming language called Samathi uh, for writing smart contracts. It uses a new flow abstraction, which represents an atomic transfer operation. Um, this operation is very common in smart contracts, so having the language is useful and convenient, but it also combines with other features that we'll discuss to um, make writing smart contracts safer. So the simplest kind of flow selects values from a source and sends them to a destination. So it looks like below, source, arrow, destination. Uh, Samathi also has features to mark types with modifiers, such as asset, which combine with flows and another thing called type quantities that make some kinds of bugs impossible. So here we have a type declaration where we use two modifiers, fungible and asset, uh, which we'll talk about more in detail later. Um, and it's represented by UN 256s um, unsigned integers, which just represents how many tokens um, this value represents. So transformers in Samathi are uh, play the role of functions or methods or procedures, et cetera. Um, transformers use parameters to transform some value. Typically, this is the last value in the argument list, but it could be any of them. Um, the parameters are sort of auxiliary information um, that is used to uh, perform this computation. So in this example, we have this transformer called transfer, which is meant to send some tokens from some account to some other account. So we have uh, balances, which is a map from addresses to tokens. The any and the one, those are the type quantities. And what it means is that balances is a map um, that contains any number of key value pairs. That's what the first any means. The keys are a type one address, meaning that it's just an address value, just like a standard value in a uh, programming language, standard programming language. Um, and the values are of type any token, meaning that they're token values that can have any um, value. So zero to the max. Um, destination is one address. So again, just, just an address. And then amount is any U256, so an unsigned integer of any value. And then the body on line four is a single flow. What we do is we look up the balance of the sender, we select amount tokens from that, and then we put it into the destination accounts balance. So we could also rewrite line four to look like the below, so it looks more like the source error destination form. The, uh, you, the version on line four is just syntactic sugar for this, uh, which is sometimes nicer. So we look up uh, in the balances uh, the sender's balance and select amount from that, and that's the source, and the destination is the uh, balance of the destination account. Um, additionally, there's a more complicated form of flows called transformer flows that have a transformer call in them. And what they do is they select values from a source, they run the transformer on each one of these values, and then they send these transformed values to the destination. So as pictured below, uh, source error transform, whatever the transformer is, uh, then to the destination. The underscore represents the position in the argument list um, that the values from the source will be inserted into. Um, in this case, there's only one argument, so it's just the one argument. But in the transfer example, we could um, put the underscore in different places depending on how we want to actually use transfer. Um, so this transformer can either be a user-defined function, like transfer, or it can be a constructor, which can create new values of name types. So if we recall our um, type declaration of token, then uh, what we can do on line two is we create a new token value that has value 10, and we put into a variable called my token, and this is a transformer flow. Another important feature of flows is that they can fail if they're not valid, uh, meaning that the selected values are not in the source or they cannot be sent to the destination. So failures are exceptions that can be caught, um, and if they're not caught, then the transaction reverts and no changes are made. Um, so here we have an example in an auction where what we want to do is when a new bid is placed, if that bid's value is greater than the current highest bid, then we want to replace the highest bid. Otherwise, we want to refund the bid to the person who placed the bid because it's not higher than the highest bid. So we declare a new type called bid, which is a consumable asset. We'll talk about consumable later. 
Um, it has some value uh, represented by a token value uh, of any possible value. Uh, we have a sender, which is just the person who placed the bid represented by an address. And then we have this try catch block. So the first thing in try block um, on line seven is this only when, essentially it's a precondition that's implemented using the flow uh, commented on line six. Um, and if this flow fails, then what happens is uh, the exception is thrown and then it's caught and we go to the catch block. But if it does succeed, then on line eight, we refund the highest bids value to whoever placed that bid. And then we destroy that bid because it no longer has any value. And then we replace it with the new bid that was placed. Otherwise, we refund the bid that was placed because it's not uh, higher than the highest bid. Uh, another important feature of Smothy is type quantities. So type quantities are used to approximate the number of values in a variable. Uh, primarily, this is to track asset variables that can be dropped. Specifically, if an asset variable is empty, then it can be dropped. Um, the type quantities that we plan to support are empty, any, one, and non-empty, representing zero values, any number of values, exactly one value, and at least one value, respectively. Uh, type quantities are uh, more or less an adaptation of linear types uh, for containers that allow us for some more precise analyses in some cases, some of which we'll see later. Um, and they can often be inferred or just inserted uh, with um, well-chosen defaults. So all the type quantities in the first example, we can actually omit. We don't need any of them. The default type quantities will give us exactly what we had. So you can write the somewhat simpler transformer definition shown below. And the last important feature of Smothy is modifiers. So modifiers specify how variables of a type can be used. We're currently planning to support five, um, asset consumable, unique, fungible, and immutable. So assets are values that must not be reused or accidentally lost. This is typically used for things like money or tokens, um, but it's also useful for things like bids in an auction or uh, votes in an election or lottery tickets or anything that we don't want to accidentally lose or overwrite. Uh, this corresponds to linear typing with uh, by default or with the use of the consumable modifier than affine typing. So consumable is an asset that may be disposed of, um, but it must be disposed of using this consume construct that we saw earlier, which documents that disposal is intentional. Um, so you won't accidentally forget about it, you intentionally destroy it. Um, for example, this is useful in this context of bids in an auction, because while we shouldn't lose bids that still have value during the auction, in Maybe safe to dispose of them after the auction ends, or if, like in our earlier example, um, a higher bit was placed. Uh, the next modifier is unique, which just means that values of this type can only be created once, um, and they must be immutable. Um, this allows us to check just once if when it's created that it hasn't been created before, and if that's the case, uh, we know that it's unique. Um, we also have fungible, which represents uh, values that can be merged and are not unique. Um, this is basically all currencies, dollars, euros, Bitcoin, Ether, et cetera, um, where it only matters how much of that currency you have, not sort of which pieces of it you have. Um, so if you have $2 and $2, you have $4. Um, you haven't lost that information by merging them together. Um, and lastly, we have immutable, which are values that cannot be changed. So this following code is not legal. So we declare a new type called T, which essentially just a wrapper around UN256, that's now immutable. We create a uh, new value of type T uh, with uh, underlying value zero, store in a variable called little t. And we try and flow 57 to little t. And this was not OK because the type uh, T is immutable. So using this more declarative flow-based approach gives us several advantages of imperative safe state updates, um, including safety guarantees, but also some other advantages. So statically, we can guarantee these things, such as that for assets, each flow will preserve the total amount of each asset type, um, so we won't lose or uh, duplicate assets, except for flows that consume or explicitly allocate assets using new, but in that case, it's clear that they will uh, they have the potential to change the number of assets. Um, immutable prevents values from changing, as discussed before, and that can be checked statically. And also, we can um, use type quantities to allow us to distinguish some cases when we're guaranteed to have empty variables versus when we can't know ahead of time. So for example, in this line of code, we use a new construct that we call filter um, to select exactly one value from x such that p of that value holds and then flow that to y. So if x has, for example, type 1t, then after the flow, we know statically that x is type empty t now if the flow succeeds. And if the flow fails, then it throws the exception and is handled somewhere else. 
Um, but after this line, it's safe to assume that X is type empty T, even though we didn't, for example, flow everything out of it. Um, because we have the type quantity, we know that it will be empty. There's also a number of static, or sorry, dynamic safety guarantees that Smathy can uh, give us. So Smathy will automatically insert dynamic checks of a flow's validity. So for example, if we're flowing money, a flow of money might fail if there's not enough money in the source or if there's too much in the destination. Um, so for example, due to overflow, because U256 is only a finite max size, um, or a flow of values from a multi-set might fail if the specified values are, um, are not found in the source. So for example, if we have a multi-set A and we select values uh, X, Y, and Z, um, if X, Y, and Z are not all in A, then that flow will fail. Um, and a flow of value might also fail if it would overwrite an asset in the destination. So for example, if we're replacing the highest bid by bid, if highest bid has type any bid, then we have to dynamically check that highest bid doesn't have any values because if we were to flow there, it would overwrite the highest bid, therefore losing money because we don't, uh, we're not keeping track of it anymore. But in some cases, this can be detected statically. So if highest bid has type one bid, then we know statically it will fail. And if highest bid has type empty bid, then we know statically that it will succeed. And we could, if we, uh, implement it this way, uh, not even have that dynamic check. And lastly, the unique modifier is also checked dynamically. Whenever the values are created, um, we check that hasn't been created before, and uh, that ensures the values will be unique. So as additional advantages, um, we hypothesize that flows will provide a clearer way of specifying how resources flow in the code itself, um, because the source and the destination and the various filters and transformations are all explicitly there. Um, it's not the imperative approach of um, you know, removing some values from our collection, maybe filtering through them, maybe transforming them, uh, possibly putting them back, and then adding some values to the destination. It will be all there in one spot, which uh, we hypothesize will be clear to developers. Um, and for a similar reason, we can automatically generate these descriptive error messages, such as the one shown below, because we know what the source is, and we know what the destination is, and we know what was supposed to be selected. Um, we don't just say underflow or overflow, we know, well, there weren't enough tokens to send here or something like that. So here's an example of using type quantities and modifiers to guarantee some correctness properties in a lottery. Um, so in addition to sort of a basic correctness property of not losing lottery tickets, we also want to ensure that each user can have at most one ticket, um, that we can't end the lottery before somebody has won, because then whoever's winning the lottery might decide that as soon as anybody plays and they know they're wrong, they'll just end the lottery, and that would be a lottery that you would not want to play in. Um, and then we also want to make sure the jackpot is fully paid out so no money gets trapped in the contract. This is a problem that happens in Ethereum fairly often. Um, so to do this, we create two new types, ticket owner, which is a unique immutable address, meaning that there will only be one ticket owner per address at most. Um, and the ticket type, which is a consumable asset, because uh, we don't want to lose tickets accidentally, but at the end of the lottery, we'll want to destroy all the tickets because perhaps we want to reset for a new lottery. Uh, so tickets have an owner, which is a ticket owner, which again ensures that these tickets will be only one per user. And they have a guess, which is whatever number they guess in the lottery. If they guess right, they win. And if they didn't guess right, then uh, they lose. Uh, now we, we're just showing this transformer to end the lottery. There would be other ones, of course, in a real implementation. Um, and lottery has the uh, multi-set of tickets, the balance, the total balance, the jackpot to be paid out, the owner of the lottery, and whatever the winning number was selected in some way. So the first thing we do on line 11 is we get all of the winning tickets. And we do this on line 12 using a filter on the tickets set, um, selecting the non-empty multi-set of tickets such that they are winners. Um, and this uh, ensures one of our correctness properties that we can't end the lottery before somebody has won, because if this filter doesn't select a non-empty multi-set, then this flow will fail and it's not caught, so this transform will fail as well. So lottery can't be ended before somebody has won. Um, and then after that, what we do is we want to pay each winner their fair share of the bounce. So we split the jackpot among each one of the winners fairly, and we use a transformer flow to essentially iterate over the multi-set of winners and pay them each their fair share. Um, and we ignore the return value because pay in this formulation doesn't return anything, it just uh, updates the balance. And finally, we send the rest of the balance to the lottery owner. So this is necessary because jackpot may not split among all the winners evenly. And in that case, um, we 
we want to make sure that we don't lose money in the contract. Um, so we have to do line 14. If we didn't have line 14, we would get an error message saying that balance has type any ether. Um, it may not be empty. It has to be empty for us to be able to drop it. And then lastly, on line 15, we consume all the tickets um, because the lottery is over. And if we wanted to, for example, redo the lottery, then we could do that now or not. Um, so this ensures all of our safety properties um, using both the type quantities, um, non-empty, and also to track that the balance still has assets in it, and also um, uh, the modifier is unique, uh, consumable, asset, immutable. Uh, next, we want to compare Samathi to Solidity, because Solidity is the most commonly used smart contract language on the Ethereum blockchain uh, by far. Um, and Solidity doesn't have support for managing assets. It's a fairly standard imperative style language. Um, so what we have is the uh, type. Uh, we have this same declaration from before declaring the type and the transformer transfer from Smothy. And then below is this equivalent code in Solidity. Uh, we declare a contract, which is essentially a class called ERC20. ERC20 is the standard that we're partially implementing. Um, there's a field called balances and then this transfer function, which again takes the address of where we're sending the tokens and the amount of tokens to send to that address. Uh, transfer is implemented in these uh, lines four to six, first by checking that the balance is sufficiently large, then subtracting the amount of tokens to send from the sender's account, and then adding them to the destination account. Um, so here we can see that the Smothly version is somewhat more concise because the body is only the single line. Um, and that um, we also get the static benefits of Samathi checking our code to make sure we didn't accidentally lose assets somewhere. Um, and that is something that Solidity doesn't have any support for. Um, and now was one more example to compare Solidity and Samathi, where we'll consider a slightly more complicated example with a, a simple voting contract that allows voters to vote on proposals. Only one vote per address is allowed, or one vote per user, um, users are represented by addresses, and then whichever proposal at the end has the most votes wins. So again, we have Smothy code on top and Solidity code on the bottom. Um, so in Smothy, we declare a type of voters as unique immutable asset addresses. This means that there will be a most one voter per address and their assets because we don't want to lose any of the voters. Um, similarly for proposal names, we don't want to have two proposals with the same name because that would be unclear what you're even voting for. Um, and then we declare a type of election to keep track of the whole thing. Uh, so we have a chairperson who manages the election, a multi-set of voters called eligible voters, um, which is in fact a set because voters are unique. Um, eligible voters is the set of people who are allowed to vote but have not yet voted. And lastly, we have this map of proposals, which maps proposal names to sets of voters, um, the set of voters that voted for that proposal. Uh, then the Solidity version, we have this contract uh, wrapping the whole thing, uh, where we have a voter struct storing information about the voters. Um, first, their weight, which, use, which uh, we use to track whether or not they've been given the right to vote. Voted, which tracks whether or not they voted, and vote, which is which proposal they voted for. And then we also have the proposals, which have a name and how many people voted for them. If we have the chairperson, we have a mapping from addresses to voter information. And lastly, we have the array of proposals. Now we're going to talk about two basic transformers that are sort of the basis of the selection system. Um, one is give right to vote, which allows people to vote. And then um, the second is vote, which does the actual voting. So first we'll talk about give right to vote. So here we again have on top the Samathi code and below we have the Solidity code. So in the Samathi code, um, we first uh, use only one to make sure that the person calling this transformer is the chairperson, because not anybody is allowed to uh, give people the right to vote, only the chairperson. Then we create a new voter uh, with whatever address and put that into the set of eligible voters. So because voters unique type, this ensures that the person has not voted before and that they haven't been given the right to vote before. Then below in the Solidity version, uh, we again check that the sender is the chairperson. And then we check that the voter has not voted then we check that the voter has not been given the right to vote by checking that the weight is zero, and then we give them the right to vote by assigning weight to be one. Um, and then for the vote uh, transformer slash function, um, we have uh, in the Smothy version, this flow on line two that implements the whole thing. We take the sender out of the set of eligible voters and put them into the set of people who voted for the specified proposal. 
So if they're not in the set of eligible voters, either because they haven't been given the right to vote or because they already voted, this will fail, but otherwise it will uh, complete the voting process for that person. The Solidity version does a similar thing um, where we first look up the voter, we make sure they haven't, uh, that they have the right to vote, that they haven't yet voted, then we mark that they have voted, we mark what they voted for, and then we add them to the corresponding proposal uh, vote count. So we can see uh, several things in these examples. One of them is that Smothy is suited to a range of applications. We talked about originally tokens, um, but also lotteries, auctions, bids, um, uh, lotteries, and uh, now voting. Um, so as in, additionally, as in this ERC-20 example that we started out with with the tokens, the Smothy implementation of this voting contract is more concise than the Solidity implementation. Um, and we also, um, see using modifiers both to enforce dynamically, such as unique, that certain um, correctness properties are uh, fulfilled, but also um, using modifiers such as asset, we can ensure statically that there are none of these um, asset, accidental asset loss problems. So in the future, we hope to fully implement Samathi by compiling it to Solidity, because that's an easy target platform for our purposes. Uh, we also want to prove the safety properties of the language, such as um, assets um, not being accidentally lost, middle values not being changed, unique values actually being unique, and so on, um, and also basic type safety. And then we want to study the benefits and costs of using this language via more in-depth methods, such as case studies, performance evaluation, and possibly studying the application of flows to other domains, either other blockchain platforms or um, even other programming languages. So in conclusion, we presented the Samathi language for writing safer smart contracts. Samathi uses our new flow abstraction, assets, modifiers, um, and type quantities to provide safety guarantees for smart contracts. Um, statically, we can guarantee that um, the assets will not be um, accidentally lost or duplicated, um, that immutable values won't change, um, that consumable assets can be consumed only if we use a consume contract on them. And dynamically, we can ensure that the flows are valid I um, mean that we can both select the values we want to select and that we can send those values to the destination. And we can also check um, the unique modifier. Um, and we also showed two examples of smart contracts in both Solidity and Samathi, showing that Samathi is capable of expressing smart contract functionality in a concise manner, but also retains the safety properties that we want when we're writing smart contracts. Uh, thank you.